So with inflation, thank you, Nathan. Hopefully you will like the, the workshop. <laughs> awesome. So can you guys hear me okay? I tend to project, so I don't think I'm going to use this mic. Well, I think we're recording this. Oh, okay, so you need this. It's finicky. You prefer them. Yeah, so I'll, I'll use this, but you guys can hear me okay. All right, so uh, I want to thank ICTP for hosting this wonderful workshop. It's really emphasized the dark universe, the fact that there are many aspects to what that phrase can mean, which is good. So it's been very, very fun to see the talks. So I'm a graduate student at the University of Pittsburgh. Uh, this work that I'll be talking about comes from these two papers uh, in collaboration with Daniel Boynovsky and Andrew Zentner. And I'm going to be talking about quantum field theory in FRW spacetime and what are the salient uh, deviations to the process of particle decay that come from talking about this in FRW rather than Minkowski. Obviously, we use uh, quantum field theory all the time in cosmology, but our usual approach is to export calculations that are done in Minkowski spacetime and then put them into cosmological models. And this is at best an approximation. I want to talk about when is that approximation warranted and, and what happens when it breaks down. So as an overview of what I'll be talking about, this is a short talk, so I don't have time to linger on everything. But I'll try to spend some time motivating this project. Then I'll talk about the formalism that we use to compute decay laws. Uh, and then I'll show two examples of using this formalism to some toy models and then talk about some implications of, of what uh, ends up appearing in the calculations, and then summarize it all with conclusions. So in a group like this, particle decay doesn't really need to be motivated. We've already seen from many of the talks today that decay processes show up all the time in cosmology, whether it be baryogenesis, leptogenesis, CP violating decays. Uh, obviously, in BBN, the lifetime of the neutron is extremely important. And particle uh, dark matter, there are models in which it has, uh, it has decay properties, right? It's constrained to have a very long lifetime, at the very least. But also, sort of cynically, particle decay is the simplest process you can do in QFT, right? It's the first thing you learn how to calculate in an introductory quantum field theory course. So what I'd like to do is compute particle decay, but not in Minkowski spacetime, rather in the Friedman-Robertson-Walker metric, OK? So everyone's familiar with this. The main important thing uh, for theorists, there are four consequences to the metric having this uh, character. So there are t uh, killing vectors which are going to enforce momentum and angular momentum conservation, because the metric is homogeneous and isotropic. But unlike in the Minkowski metric, this one has explicit time dependence through uh, the scale factor A. And so this means there's no time-like killing vector. And so energy is, strictly speaking, not conserved. Uh, furthermore, it's conformal to Minkowski, and I'll be basically working in conformal time for the rest of the talk. But this third point, that energy is not conserved, is extremely important because usually how we compute decay laws in quantum field theory is by writing down something called the S matrix. Okay, The S matrix is a unitary matrix constructed in the interaction picture out of the interacting Hamiltonian. That's all fine, but in order to extract a decay law from the S matrix, one has to take the infinite time limit and enforce energy conservation. Then divide the whole expression by t, and the leading order term is the decay law. Since you don't have energy conservation, and in FRW, does it really make sense to take the infinite time limit? That approach is a little suspect. So I would like to avoid having to go through the S matrix and still be able to compute decay laws. Okay? Before I do that, let's talk about field quantization in FRW. So working in conformal time, one can write down the Lagrangian densities for scalar and fermion fields. So here I'm showing for scalar fields. You can see uh, this chi is what's called a conformally rescaled field. Uh, it's just a, a scalar field expressed in conformal time. And the Lagrangian density looks very similar to what you usually get in the Klein-Gordon equation, except there is this now effective mass term, which depends on conformal time. And all of that time dependence is coming through the sc uh, scale factor and its derivatives. The spatial part of the equations of motion can still be solved with Fourier transforms. Nothing changes there. But for the temporal part, these GKs, which are the mode functions, have a much more complicated uh, differential equation. Okay? Uh, in Minkowski spacetime, this M term wouldn't depend on time, and this would just be complex exponentials. 
But in FRW, this M term depends explicitly on what cosmological epoch you're using, or if you want to include all the terms from, from the Friedman equation, it, it gets very onerous very quickly, okay? So in principle, solving this equation is very difficult, but it can be done approximately in a way I'll, I'll talk about in a second. Similar story for the fermion fields. If you write the conformally rescaled version of them, all the time dependence gets lumped into this effective mass term. The spatial part remains just Fourier transforms, but now these spinorial mode functions have to satisfy these differential equations. Okay, so solving these is difficult. Uh, for various cosmological epochs, they can be solved ex uh, exactly in terms of uh, parabolic cylinder functions, et cetera. But I would like to avoid all that. And what I'm really interested in, just how much of a deviation do you have from Minkowski space-time when the uh, particle physics scale is very well separated from the expansion of the universe? So there's two scales in this problem, the rate at which the universe is expanding and sort of the energy at, of the particle physics processes that are happening, happening. And I'd like to expand in the ratio of those scales. This is a, an adiabatic approximation. And so how it's implemented here, I'm showing it for like the scalar mode functions. One writes down a WKB on Zots. Uh, these W functions then can be expanded in terms of derivatives of the frequencies. And this frequency is this K squared plus the effective mass squared, okay? Yeah. The M squared is like a M, little M squared times scale factor squared plus some term proportional to the, the coupling, C, right? So it's like an A prime prime over A term. That's all that's inside here. So for right now, I haven't said anything. The coupling is generic. And actually, in the adiabatic approximation, one can show that the A prime prime over A term actually is higher order adiabatic than the order I'm going to be going to, so it doesn't even matter. Additionally, I'm going to work primarily in RD, in which that term vanishes manifestly, right? So it doesn't really matter. The fermion fields in the Lagrangian, there is an M squared term and there is an IM term. No, no, he's referring to the physics equation. Oh, yeah, this should be M. That's a typo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is a typo. Yes. But I think this is short talk, so maybe we should save questions until the end. Otherwise, I'll never get through anything. <laughs> right. Okay. So I'm going to be doing this adiabatic approximation, and I'm going to go to zeroth order. So I'm going to assume that there's a wide separation in these scales. And this is sort of intuitively what we do when we graft a particle physics calculation into cosmology, right? But notice at zeroth order, which is just saying these Ws are these omegas, zeroth order is still not Minkowski because these omegas depend on time, okay? So even at zeroth order, there may be, and spoiler alert, there is, departures from the usual Minkowski result in certain uh, conditions. Now this expansion, as I said, is, is really uh, a physical expansion in the ratio of the Hubble over the physical co-moving energy of the particle. And this is just the Lorentz factor, which shows up. OK, so for the rest of the talk, I'm working at zeroth order adiabatic. And I'm going to consider that I'm working in the radiation-dominated cosmological epoch. So now how do I extract? I need a formalism to extract the decay law. I don't want to use the S matrix for reasons I already said. So there is another formalism. This is known as the wigner weiskopf method. It's primarily used in quantum optics. We've adapted it to be used in cosmology. Uh, it works very simply. So just to advertise its features, it's a, a unitary method. It's a non-perturbative method. It requires the interaction picture. Despite the fact that it's non-perturbative, it still requires small couplings. Okay? And it allows for you to directly calculate the transition amplitudes and probabilities. So what does one do? I'm just going to fly through this pretty quickly. You write down the Schrodinger equation in the interaction picture. You expand in the Fock basis. This generates for you a hierarchy of differential equations. You close that hierarchy by choosing some initial conditions. You say, like, I'm starting out in a state A, right? This interaction Hamiltonian connects that state A to all the intermediate particle states, kappa. And each of those kappa states is connected back to A. So that makes a closed system of differential equations. You can solve them by introducing this object, which is uh, known as the self-energy. And it is related to sort of the, the thing you will compute in a one-loop calculation, OK? Uh, and with this self-energy, you can solve these differential equations. And the solution looks like this, uh, where these CA squareds, which are the survival probability of the initial state, are related to this integral of the real part of the self-energy. And this is the self-energy. Okay? 
Obviously, if this gamma, which is going to in fact be the decay rate, if it's time independent, then it just comes out and you get an e to the minus gamma t, the usual exponential decay. So what do you do then to use this method? You compute the self-energy, plug it into this formula, and look at the results. So that's what I'm going to do. So let's consider first as a model, a very toy model, a massive scalar decaying to two massless scalars. Does this apply to the energy Correct. You don't need energy conservation to do this calculation. What, what Hamiltonian? The Hamiltonian is complex, yeah. The, so the Hamiltonian, you still can write down the interaction Hamiltonian. It's the same thing as you get. It doesn't conserve energy, but you can still write down. We can talk more about this after, but there's a lot of algebra you have to do to show that you can still write down some unitary operator. Okay. But yeah, we didn't invent this method, but uh, it, you can use it in this way. We can talk more afterwards. So when you apply it to a model like a massive scalar decaying to massless scalars, uh, a couple things happen. So first, let's look at what happens if we consider an initial state that is born at rest in its co-moving frame. Okay. When you plug all of this into the equations I showed before, this comes out for the survival probability. This is exactly what you get for mass matrix. Okay? So this is telling you that the expansion of the space time does nothing to a particle with co-moving momentum zero. If the particle is relativistic, however, initially, you get these results. Let me explain. So because cosmic redshift is happening, my initial relativistic particle will not always remain relativistic. Over time, its wavelength will stretch. And so there is some time scale TNR beyond which the particle is sufficiently transitioned into being non-relativistic, before which it is relativistic. And the survival probability looks different depending on which regime you're in. For T less than TNR, the survival probability has this stretched, stretched exponential character, which is uh, completely unique from what you get in Minkowski spacetime. After the particle is transitioned to being uh, non-relativistic, here's the usual Minkowski piece, but there's this extra term uh, coming from the fact that the particle has redshifted. These uh, decay laws are, are, these decay rates are generically smaller than the Minkowski results, and this can be understood as a consequence of just local time dilation and the effect of cosmic shift. NR means non relativistic, and this is TNR. So this emerges naturally throughout the calculation, but all it is is basically a time, it, you can see it's the momentum over the mass, right, plus the Hubble. So. It's just tracking when the particle, beyond this time, the particle has become non-relativistic due to cosmic redshift. OK, so that's the scalar to scalar case. What about a massive scalar to massless fermions with Yukawa coupling? So like a Higgs type scenario, right? Well, here, we can do the same thing. Let's first calculate the decay rate at rest. And notice we don't get the exact Minkowski result. We have these extra terms, this term with anomalous dimension, for instance. These are a consequence of the fact that this theory, unlike the previous one, is renormalizable. And one has to do the renormalization in the wigner weisskopf method. We do this by using the dynamical renormalization group methods and introducing a time scale TB, which is sort of like the renormalization time scale. And the way to think about this is there's some time scale in which your initial state is being dressed by quantum fluctuations. And beyond that time scale, you have basically a quasi-particle state, which then decays. Okay? And this is that survival probability of that quasi-particle state. You can do the same calculation in Minkowski spacetime. You get exactly the Minkowski result. When you do it in FRW, you don't. You get these extra terms. That, this is, the reason these extra terms are surviving and, and appearing here is because the time dependency of the frequencies is sort of encoding and preserving the, renormalizability, the renormalization physics. So the short time scale physics is surviving. Okay? For the relativistic case, it's very similar. While the particle is sufficiently uh, relativistic, the result is, again, is actually very similar to the scalar case. It's the stretched exponential. After the particle has transitioned to being non-relativistic, those terms encoding the short scale physics are reappearing. Okay? And th these extra terms then are, can be understood as a confluence of uh, time-dependent frequencies and a renormalizable theory. OK, so you, at this point, you're probably asking, so how important are these extra terms? Do I really have to go through this process, or can I just use the regular matrix result? Maybe these terms are really, really small, right? So I want to show you two places where this could be important. So the first is when the lifetime of your particle is extremely long. And here is the most sort of boring plot you could make of this. I'm just calculating the percent error between the usual Minkowski result and this FRW result. OK? So here, let's consider a particle that's born initially at the gut scale. 
let's mandate that the particle goes from being relativistic to non-relativistic, uh, close to matter radiation equality. That's tantamount to basically fixing K over M, okay? And again, uh, considering a very small Yukawa coupling, we're assuming then the lifetime is gonna be extremely long. And what do we see? So here on the x-axis is the red shift at which you're looking to see has the particle decayed, okay? You can see that when the red shift is larger than one over a and r, the error is quite large, okay? However, as you go towards the present, the error becomes small because as the particle becomes sufficiently non-relativistic, these other effects don't matter. They wash out. So this, this calculation is basically saying that it, using the Minkowski result is problematic when you're dealing with a particle that's relativistic for a long time that sees a lot of the cosmic expansion. Okay? Another place this could uh, show up is in the physics of the early universe in, in quantum kinetics. So over here what I've written down is the basic quantum kinetic uh, calculation that one does when you're dealing with some particle, in this case chi, that is talking to these phi particles, and these phi particles are already thermalized, and you want the chi particle to enter into, uh, thermal, enter into a thermal distribution, okay, to thermalize with this bath. If you assume that the phi's are already thermalized, you can write down the, the quantum kinetic master equation, which is a gain term minus a loss term. This n is the uh, distribution for the chi particles. The gain term looks like this. The loss term looks like this. This allows you to write that the loss is equal to the gain by this uh, exponential factor. This is known as detailed balance. And then when you solve this master equation, what you get, is, so this is the differential equation. When you solve it, you get that NK asymptotically approaches, in this case, since these are scalars, a Bose-Einstein distribution. So this is the usual thing you do, okay? And this sort of undergirds all the quantum kinetics that we do, whether it be in cosmology or not. However, notice, there are these energy conservation delta function, functions appearing here, and I've already said that those are suspect. So we should really wonder if we can use this approach. Furthermore, these gammas are essentially uh, the inverse decay and decay uh, rates, and we've already seen that sometimes those can be sufficiently different from the Minkowski case. So what we intend to do is report on basically how, how and when this kinetic, quantum kinetics changes when you actually calculate everything in FRW. Okay, so to summarize, this formalism allows you to compute the decay law analytically in FRW space-time uh, to zeroth order adiabatic. The decay rate you get is a time-dependent effective decay rate. It's always smaller than the Minkowski result, but may approach it asymptotically. Uh, this smallness is due to cosmic redshift and local time dilation. For fermions, because it's a renormalizable theory, there's this interesting extra terms that appear. This is because the theory is renormalizable. And then the most important sentence in my entire talk, if you take nothing else away, is that using the S matrix is best an approximation. At worst, you are blinding yourself to crucial non-equilibrium dynamics and other modifications to the decay law. So you should be very careful when you just take something that works for BBN and use it for something like dark matter. Thank you. We have time for one question. I wanted to ask you, uh, did you think to incorporate thermal corrections in your calculation? It's, it's yeah. funny because in an adiabatic expansion, the scale factor and the temperature are related. Right, yeah, so we don't do that in these calculations. That's a good point, and it's actually something we've been thinking about. So the answer is yes, I thought about it. No, we haven't. <laughs> okay. So, so, but it's a good point. Useful. <laughs> yeah. What's the, the vacuum state? In this case, the vacuum state is the adiabatic vacuum, right? So it's it's the Bunch Davies vacuum, right? It's the usual thing you do in Burel and Davies. Actually, this calculation is surprising that this has not been done. In the 80s, there was all this work on doing quantum field theory in pure space time and then it just stopped. So I was really surprised when I started doing this calculation that there was no other paper that had tried to do it's because the S matrix approach, there were also papers in the 80s showing you that you shouldn't use that. So you have to have another formalism, and it turns out the people who have been doing quantum optics have this formalism sitting there waiting for some cosmologist to come along and just steal it. So it didn't work. So we have a really good Canberra. Yeah. What you can show is 
go is for that all the particles that we know actually exist, right, these effects are going to be negligible. And we talked about that in the data. The point of that plot is to say when you start doing new physics, when you start postulating new particles that have really long lifetimes, if you're having those particles decay at that redshift, you should not be using them in time. Well, the neutron has long lifetimes. Yes, but for the new, yeah, we can talk about this later, but the neutron is actually, it works out to be negligible. Even neutrons. Even neutrons. Is that because neutrons are not crea uh, creating that later? Uh, yes, it's because it's when the neutron's born, it's already basically non-relativistic, right? It's already almost in the way you're Exactly, saying. exactly. Yes, because you can make electric photons. Uh, exactly. Like, uh, and it, even if you keep all these terms and compute it, they're just such small effects that you won't see. Yeah, essentially, you're saying the more... Hello, you hello. Are the more, the before you are, the more the negative from the yeah. yeah, it's not Thank surprising. You. Then, of course, the noise is obvious when you say that word. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, fine. So, Let's thank him again. So now we continue with Otavio. So I'll keep track of the time, okay? Okay. So good afternoon, everyone. First, I'd like to thank the organizers for this opportunity. And my name is Otavio, Otavio Alves. I'm a master's student in an institute very far away, yes, IFT. <laughs> yes, and uh, Rogério Rosenfeld is my advisor. My condolences. What? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And today I'm gonna talk about one of the projects I'm involved in. Is probing dark matter properties using photometric surveys, and we are doing this inside the dark energy survey. I would like to emphasize that this is not the only way in which the Dark Energy Survey can probe dark matter. It's, uh, it's an amazing galaxy survey that has a lot of different approaches. But I would like to mention this in uh, specific. So let's start with the most important question here. What is dark matter? Well, I don't know. But usually, in cosmology, we model as a pressureless perfect fluid. Really? But that might not be the case. And uh, in generalized dark matter, we, liked, we want to generalize and uh, allow for the dark matter to actually have some pressure and maybe behave as some imperfect fluid, as many dark matter candidates really do. So let's start with the energy momentum tensor. We parameterize the, the pressure uh, in the background and in perturbations using these two functions, W, and then effective sound speed. And uh, we also have the, uh, this anisotropic component that is parameterized by this parameter, the viscosity. So this effective sound speed really allows for the pressure perturbations to have something else beyond this adiabatic sound speed. So these are the equations for the evolution of delta and theta, the density and the velocity perturbations. And we implemented these equations on class. So here I just summarize a list of papers that explore this approach to probing dark matter properties. These things started with Wayne Hu in 1998. And I would just like to mention some of these. Uh, the first approach is just to set a constant value for these three functions and try to constrain. This was done by Thomas, Kopp, and Scottis using CMB data. Uh, this paper by Kopp, Scottis, Thomas, and I don't know how to pronounce that name. Uh, here they allow for the, the equation of state W to vary on time, but they fix the other parameters. This is, this is a very interesting paper. And uh, we have some other approaches like uh, this paper uses a CPL type parameterization for, for the equation of state, just constrain the, the value and the first derivative. So, talk a little bit about the phenomenology, the phenomenology of, this, of these parameters. Let's focus on W and the speed of sound. The main effect on W, of W on the matter power spectrum is that it changes the moment of matter radiation equality. So, this effect is mainly degenerated with omega matter. And you, you can have here that this, this shift on the matter radiation equality time imposes a shift on the turnover 
in the matter power spectrum. Okay? And the main effect of the, the, this sound speed is to suppress the power at small scale because you have this exchange in, in, in energy due to the propagation of sound waves in the dark matter fluid. These are very exaggerated values for these parameters. Here are more reasonable ones. And here you see the effect on the matter power spectrum and the fractional difference, difference from lambda CDM. OK? So this is enough about generalized dark matter. Let's talk about the dark energy survey. We mentioned photomet photometric surveys, but we have in mind the dark energy survey in specific. It's a galaxy survey that uses the Victor Blanco telescope in Chile. Equi <laughs> what? <laughs> Equipped with uh, this amazing camera that we call DCAM. Wow. I think it should be capitalized, but OK. The DCAM, the dark energy camera, is a 570 megapixel camera. We have these nice images. And it maps one eighth of the sky with this nice footprint that resembles a tank, a war tank. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Here are the Magellanic clouds. And one of the main goals of the Dark Energy Survey is to explore the weak, weak gravitational lensing effect on images we take from the telescope. Here we see an example of strong lensing. We have a huge mass here in the middle. And you can see the effect on galaxy shapes around. Even if you go farther from the center of the, the image, you can see that the, the, the shapes of galaxies kind of correlate. So in the dark energy survey, we want to explore these correlations between shapes and also between position. So we have the weak lensing effect, and we can explore the large scale structure by itself, and the cross correlation between these two effects. But this is a Hubble Space Telescope image, and a really beautiful image. But usually, we have to measure the shapes for galaxies that are much uh, less bright in our sky. And uh, here is the, what would be our image if we didn't have a lot of effects going on on, a, on, the, on the imaging process. Here is kind of the shear these images suffer from gravitational lensing. Here the effect is exaggerated. Usually our galaxies have a 3%, 1% uh, change in, in shape. That's much less than the strong cases that we saw in the, in the image. We have atmosphere. We are limited by detectors. And we also have noise. So we have to estimate shapes from images like this. That's way harder to do. And, the, and this is example for stars. We usually stars are used to 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 uh, calculate the convolutional kernel that the atmosphere imposes in the image and things like that. Very observational. <laughs> so it is a photometric redshift. So we don't measure full spectra to obtain the redshift of galaxies. We actually take images in five different optical and near infrared filters. They are plot here. And uh, to estimate the photometric redshift, we use some machine learning techniques, trained on spectroscopic samples, and it's a very, a very hard process in which we get errors larger than the spectroscopic sample this. But uh, as we have much more galaxies, we hope that the statistical significance of our sample uh, to, to, to be very way better. Usually in photometric surveys, we have now hundreds of millions of galaxies instead of thousands of galaxies, and that's really amazing. So from, 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 the, from the catalogs extracted from the images, these correlation functions are computed. Here I just show you the example of that. The correlations functions for shapes. And uh, the cross correlation between the shear and the positions. And, uh, and here is just the correlation between positions. So we have this huge data vector that is our observable. 
and we want to, com to compare it to our model, or better, to compare our model to it. So how do you take that power spectrum and compare it to dark energy survey data? Well, you have to first compute these power spectra, these specific power spectra, this, the, com for the convergence field, for the density field, and the cross-correlation between them. Here are the kernels you have to use in these integrals. You have to transform that to real space, because you calculate it in the Fourier space. And then you have the same data vector. So OK, you might think, well, we, we know how to model the power spectrum. We know how to convert that into the DES data vector. So we just make plots. We just run in CMC chains and make parameter estimation, right? No. We have a lot of effects that might be going on here. And we have to really be careful to really try to account for all of them. First, how to model nonlinear scales in our model, in our generalized dark model parameterization? Second, could the detection of generalized dark matter be a result of systematics, like errors on photosies, or maybe result of some uh, intrinsic alignment of galaxies that we didn't take into account properly? Yeah, this is obvious. We have to compare our code with other codes. And what prior information should we use in our primary estimation? So these are, are all questions that are not trivial to address. For this first, here, of course, we have to exclude scales that we don't know how to model. And we have to know what scales we can model and what scales we cannot. We, have, we need this idea. Here, I just mentioned this, this kind of new paper in which they define a halo model for generalized dark matter. is a, a nice way to try to model these nonlinear scales. Comparison with other codes we also did. And here, just showing some uh, a picture forecast for DS year three data. And uh, I compare with the, 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 with, with the picture forecast for Planck. And, uh, and also including supernovae here and BAO. And you can see that usually Planck does well better than DES and other surveys in many parameters. But for this generalized dark matter model, we hope to constrain the sound speed way better than Planck did. Here I show a zoom. Here just to, to show one more interesting thing from that paper I mentioned, the dark matter equation in state through cosmic history, they actually divided the the, the cosmic history in these bins and allowed for the, the generalized dark matter equation of state to vary independently on each of these bins. And as they use Planck power spectrum, they have nice constraints in the Planck era, in the CMB era. But uh, probably if we include data from DS or other surveys, we can do better in this region. And in, in, in this way, we can measure the equation of state of dark, of dark matter without uh, basing on any specific candidate. It's a totally uh, free model, let's say. We could also do some PCA and try to constrain the main modes, the principal modes that our survey and uh, our data are better in constraining. I think that's it. Thank you. We have time for questions, yeah? OK. So what is the difference between generalized dark matter and warm dark matter? Well, generalized dark matter is more, let's say, general. Actually, you can map. <laughs> <laughs> Thank yeah, you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's true, because you can map the warm dark matter to generalized dark matter just doing the uh, uh, proper parameterization using W and the CS. Yeah. It's like if you mess the neutrino, you can uh, identify all of the parameters that uh, the specific parameters into this, uh, within this mode plus the moments, right? Yeah, you can. Uh, can, you, can you make an example you know, this, uh, what is of the what is the CS? Ah, yeah. Okay, like warm dark matter is a particular case of generalized dark matter. 
Yeah, be because it has a specific evolution of W and the adiabatic sound speed uh, is taken from W. So I think for warm dark matter, H to the, I think W scales with H to the minus, no, I have to check that. But for example, if dark matter was a scalar field, that's kind of strange, but you would have CS equals one, I think. Things like that, you can map some models to the generalized dark matter framework. And even if your model is not, does not have an exact map, you can, uh, in, in a, uh, you can maybe uh, grasp some of the aspects of your model in generalized dark matter. And if we somehow measure parameters that deviate from lambda CDM, we can maybe have an idea on what models to look for to maybe fix this problem. Um, so what's the physical interpretation of a equation of state for dark matter that is uh, less than zero? And how do you model the sound speed in this case? Is, is it an independent parameter or it depends on the equation of state you are choosing? The sound speed, the effective sound speed is independent. Is independent, yeah. You. And the physical interpretation of W physical, less than zero. For dark matter, yeah, that would be strange, right? <laughs> yeah, that would be strange. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. So, further questions? So, I thank the speaker again. So let's continue with Tassio talking about its models and dark matter. So it's working now? Okay. Okay, my name is Tessio. I'm a PhD student from Paraíba University and International Institute of Physics. And I'm going to talk about a model with two Higgs doublets. Uh, and in this framework, we embed dark matter and neutrino masses. Uh, this is based on these two papers here. So, uh, two doublet models are very popular extensions of the standard model in which we include an extra Higgs doublet. Uh, its popularity is in part because of supersymmetry, which requires at least two Higgs doublets, but also uh, because of other things. You can have extra CP violating phases, so you can uh, try to do biogenesis. We are not going to do that. Uh, you can have a dark matter candidate if one of the doublets is inert. You can have axions and so on and so forth. So it's a simple framework in which you, you can do a lot of things. So uh, this kind of model faces a problem, which is the presence of flavor change in neutral currents. Uh, these processes, uh, one example of these processes is the oscillation, the mass oscillation, KK bar. Uh, experimentally, it is known that uh, the weights of this kind of processes are very suppressed. 
And in the standard model, it happens only at the loop level. But uh, when you have uh, extra neutral scalars, these processes can happen at three level because uh, the doublets in principle couple to all of the fermions. Uh, and if this happens at three level, you will, will be in risk of violating uh, uh, experimental constraints. So it's a problem you have to avoid this some, somehow. And uh, the usual way to do that is uh, by imposing a discrete symmetry, by assigning uh, suitable parities for the doublets and the, the fermions. You can uh, remove some Yukawa couplings and uh, avoid the flavor changing uh, currents. So uh, there are some uh, ways to do that. And this gives rise to uh, some types of, of trihex doublet models. But uh, in this case, in the scalar potential, you must keep a term that uh, violates explicitly this discrete symmetry. So you impose the symmetry, and at the same time, you break it. So it is not so aesthetical. But you are forced to do so because uh, if you remove this term, uh, you end up with uh, the domain wall problem, which uh, handles the, the model uh, unviable cosmologically. So uh, a more appealing way to, to avoid the flavor changing problem is by means of a gauge symmetry. Uh, by demanding that the doublets have different charges uh, from each other under this uh, new abelian symmetry. Uh, you can uh, avoid flavor changing in a similar way you do with a discrete symmetry. But this time you are free uh, from any domain wall. And also uh, with a gauge symmetry, we can, have, we can do more things. We have an extra gauge boson, which we call Z prime. And we can uh, take advantage of this uh, to attack some more problems. Uh, as we have a gauge symmetry, we have to take into account the uh, gauge anomalies. We have to cancel them. Uh, and in this model, there are uh, some possibilities to, to cancel. Uh, there are a lot of possible charge, charge assignments for the fields. Uh, it is possible to cancel them without extra fermions, like in this, those cases here. Or if you add extra fermions, you have uh, more possibilities. Uh, in this work, we, we focus on the B minus L case in which we add three right-handed neutrinos. So these neutrinos help to cancel the anomalies and we can uh, implement type one CSO and generate neutrino masses. Uh, we also include an extra uh, fermion, which will be our dark matter candidate. We assume that this fermion is a vector-like fermion to not spoil the anomaly cancellation. And uh, the mass of the, uh, this, this dark matter will interact primarily through the Z prime. Uh, and we assume that the mass of this uh, uh, dark matter is uh, something about uh, a few TV in this scale. And also uh, the Z prime is in this, uh, mass scale. So uh, this dark matter candidate is produced uh, uh, thermally by the standard freeze out. Uh, these are some diagrams that contribute to the uh, annihilation and uh, by keeping this uh, dark matter in equilibrium in the early universe. And uh, direct detection experiments uh, are very constraining in this kind of scenario, uh, as you can see here. So uh, here we have in this axis the mass of the Z prime, and here the gauge coupling constant. Uh, this line here uh, corresponds to the uh, bounds of uh, xenon one ton uh, direct detection. 
and uh, all this region above this line is, is are excluded. Uh, for the points uh, on this red line here, uh, we will produce the right valley abundance. So as you can see, uh, most of the points that we, uh, we produce the right valley abundance are already excluded by, by direct detection. Only this uh, small region here that produced the right valley abundance and escaped direct detection. Uh, these other lines here represent the uh, perspective uh, of future direct detection experiments. But the current boundary is set by, by this line here. Uh, we put also the, the bound from the LHC uh, by, uh, just, uh, for searches for a, a, a Z prime. But as you can see, this bound is subdominant. Uh, notice also that uh, we here we are in the resonance. We, for this, uh, this plot, we, we fix the mass of the dark matter at one TV. And the mass of, of the mediator is twice the mass of the dark matter. Uh, so away from the resonance, uh, you cannot reproduce the, the right valley abundance. Uh, we can try to ameliorate this, uh, this situation by uh, assuming some late entropy injection that we parameter, parameterize uh, by this delta parameter here, which is a dilution factor uh, of the, the relic abundance. So this can be generated by a late time inflation or the decay of a heavy particle. We don't care about the specific mechanism, but in the end of the day, this, this will dilute the relic abundance and uh, it's encoded in this data here. So for uh, this specific value of 10, uh, uh, of a dilution factor of 10, we see that uh, there is uh, more parameter space available. But even in this case, the future experiments will be uh, able to, to rule out this scenario if no signal is seen. So if you increase the mass of the dark matter from 1 TV to 3 TV, uh, we have to increase also the mass of the Z prime because you have to stay at the resonance. But the situation doesn't change much qualitatively. Uh, notice here that the bound from the LHC doesn't even appear because you have a, a heavier Z prime. Uh, so that's it. Uh, in conclusion, we have uh, a more appealing version of Turing's doublet model uh, in which we solve the flavor changing problem uh, in a more elegant way by means of a gauge symmetry. With this gauge symmetry, we uh, uh, produce neutrino, massive neutrinos. No, no, we don't discuss this, yes. Uh, and yeah, the, the model survives the, the current bounds and can be proved by, by the future experiments. Oh, thanks. No, no, but he, he didn't. You will discuss it later, probably, no, but no, you will never discuss it. <laughs> so, an alternative to this model, if uh, if you introduce a singlet that mixes with chi via the back expectation value that gives mass to As the set prime. A scalar singlet? A U and B minus L singlet. So you can make the, the dark matter, uh, you can regulate the component in the U and prime of the, without introducing delta, and then dilute your bounds, I guess. So then, uh, but, but oh, maybe... Yeah. In Maybe this case, not. we have a, a scalar singlet that breaks uh, you want B minus. Oh, you have, yeah, you have yeah. it because you, you have the mass for set prime. Uh, anyway, but you introduce a fermion singlet. I mean, ah, okay, a fermion singlet. That mixes, yeah. uh, so to give more freedom to, to I, I don't know how it works. But. 
Further questions? No? So let's thank the speaker again. Good afternoon for everyone. Okay, so let's continue. Oh, sorry. Okay, good afternoon for, for everyone. I will present here, uh, okay, a very short analysis from general singlet extension of the MSSM. Okay, I will start this talk, review very shortly this very interesting model, and then Okay, I analyze the next minimal supersymmetric standard model, show some results, and at the end, I will show that, uh, okay, we need uh, to extend this model for this kind of, of model. Okay, and I will provide you some very good cosmological consequence of this kind of model. Okay. Okay, the minimal... The minimal supersymmetric standard model. Okay, we we have to introduce two two rigs, edge one and edge two are very similar uh, similar ones in the double Higgs model. You have doublets, left wing doublets and singlets with high hundred, and here I use these notations because. On the on the on the Kirchhoff superfields, you put left-handed leptons, and here, okay, we we know when you put uh, in the standard model uh, singlets, they are high hundred. Then, because to remember this, I use this this notation. Okay, here, on very interesting things, very interesting things in the minimal supersymmetric standard model is that you can introduce what you call R conservation, R parity, and you can divide the superpotential in two parts. One conserve R, R parity, and another one that don't conserve R parity. When you conserve R parity, okay, the terms are this one, here, these terms mixing the Higgs inus to form the neutral inus and charge inus. And these three terms, we get you call a couple for given mass for the charged leptons, for D, top, D quarks and O quarks. And when you concern the R, R term, terms that violate R parity, you have this one that mixing the usual neutrinos with Higgs inus. And then, in this case, we get a, a matrix where one neutrino gets mass at three level, and the two other neutrinos need to, these two terms to get correction at one loop level. And these terms uh, will produce a contribution for double, be double beta decay without neutrinos. And these terms here is usually the danger, the dangerous ones because they induce the protons decay and also neutral and anti-neutral uh, neutral anti -neutral oscillations. Okay? In the case where we have 
in the MSS, in the MSSM are conserved. Neutralinos are usually the candidate for dark matters. And in this case of models, the pseudo-scalars are heavier than D0, and the charged Higgs are heavier than the double bosons. And also, we can get a neutralino sectors very good for, for cosmological constants. But then, why you need to consider another kind of models? The range is in here. When you have to, to get the spectral mass for the neutralinos, we need to put this, the mean parameters as the values as in the order of the double mass. And that is what we call the mean problems. And the usual way to solve these problems is to, to, to construct this next to minimal supersymmetric standard model, where we have the same uh, the, the same spectrum is as in the MSSM, but now we introduce a new singlet fields. Now there are singlets of SU2 and the hypercard is zero. And now when you expand this in the Kirau, the, the scalar one get a vacuum expectation values. That is the same order of H1, H2. Then you can explain why these terms here is of, of, of this here, because of this here we get lambda pl uh, times t. And, and, uh, uh, and in the superpotential of this model, we get the, the Yukawa terms plus these two, two terms here. When you get this new superpotential, okay, we get a, a scalar potential very similar ones as in the MSSM. In MSSM, the, this term is equal to this one with the supersymmetry, you no? Know, because uh, we, we came here from from the superpotential and uh, the F and D terms, you know? And okay, you have this one. In this model, okay, when you fix lambda times t's and k times t's, okay, we recuperate, in this case, the, the results as you get on the MSSM. Okay, I will present very, very short the, the main results, without the result, okay. On the charged case from charged Higgs, we get uh, Goldstone bosons, but now we get uh, charged that, his, that has these expressions. You can see here you have the minimal, the minus signal. Then it means that this surge at Higgs can be, can be lighter than MW. And here, okay, I show some uh, okay, plots on the, here is the mass mass, and here the, the Higgs mass from some beta parameters, and here considering some She's, she's values from the, from the, the new scholars. Now I can, you can see, you can get, uh, okay, very light charged Higgs. Why it's so interesting? Because it is, we remember when we recognize the sector on the Higgs sectors, on the MSSM, the charged and pseudo charges have a, common parameters, the beta parameters. And when you, we, we, we talk about the pseudo scholars, we now get one goldstone bosons and two massive states. But now, on this, because now we have this minus, we can get, okay, as in the same one, we can get a very light Higgs. Okay, and it's and in, in some uh, uh, papers I, I have seen, okay, it, it is a nice a nice consequence of this kind of models to to the cosmological analysis. And now, okay, on this model, when you go for to get the neutralino mass, 
we get two main results. The first is the Siglinos, the uh, supersymmetric partners from the S scholars. They do not mix directly with the Gauginos, neither from SU2, neither from 1 1, but they mix with the two Rigzinos from the doublet. And, okay, I'm not showing here the mass max, but when, oh, sorry. But when you go to get some uh, value from the neutralinos, you can see you can get very light, light uh, neutralinos from around 200 GV. But now the main motivation to generalize the NMSSN is, is about because the superpotential of uh, next minimum supersymmetric standard model has a zipli asymmetry, then you can construct a general supersymmetric uh, MSSM. No, here we have the general superpotential. If you consider these parameters, these parameters and me two equals zero, you get net minimum supersymmetric standard model. And now when you get this me, me two, and this kappa equals zero, we have what we call nearly minimum supersymmetric standard model where Professor Cardi, and Professor uh, Marcella Macarena has done some very interesting uh, articles which gave me to study this. And now can, you can realize what I have done in the MSSM. And again, you can get very light uh, pseudo scholars and very and uh, neutral lines with 200 GVs. But now what is interesting in this kind of model, we can show uh, that the, there is a very nice upper bound on the mass of light neutral scar given by these, these values. And uh, this is what I have done, okay? Try to understand uh, uh, light scalars and uh, Neutralino variable candidate from <coughs> from this kind of model. That's what. I'm, yes. Question. Uh, for Marcus, what are C1, C2, and C3? Are constants there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The constants. Uh, there are the expressions from this, but I, I don't write it here because they're very huge and the space is not so. Ah, okay, and, and they depend on what? They're, they depend on, on what, this C1, C2? C3. Oh, depending on all this. Ah, okay. Depend on, uh, okay, what kind of access you are doing. So I'm trying to get, okay, so from the MSSM to NMSSM or NMSSM to generalized MSSM, I didn't see what was the cosmological implications between from one from the other. Oh, because the, the, the very, very big problem with MSSM is there are, the, the, uh, the all the scholars are very constrained. No, no, you, you, you don't have, for example, you cannot get from MSSM very light pseudo scholars. We can get only in this kind of model. Yes. No, I, was one, I was wondering uh, if you look at your last slide, you go to slide 10. Oh, so, yeah, yeah, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10. 10, 10. 10, 10. 10. Yeah. Uh, the last one, the last one. Number that is 10. six. Yes. Around the nine. No, 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 I'm not asking about numerical results. That, uh, that upper bound, that, uh, that is a three level upper bound, right? Yeah, yeah, and yes. And you can put quantum corrections. Yes, you, you can, you can okay, put, yes, yeah, yes, that one. Yes, Very that's good. right. Yeah. And then I ask you something else later. More questions? No? So let's thank this speaker again.
be my problem. No, I have this one. You want to use this one? If it works. So does it work? Okay, uh, we continue with the last short talk of the day. Okay, uh, thank you. So uh, I will talk about uh, a bit about the project that we are doing with uh, the group listed, listed here, which is related to possibility of maybe seeing dark CP violation in the Frick's debit model. Uh, so first let me start with answering the question, why do we work on the Frick's debit model? The shortest answer would be because it's one of the possible models that can exist. And although standard model, well, it's a very good theory, very well tested, it still doesn't answer certain problems like the problem of dark matter, CB violation, that we think we need more than what we have in a standard model, uh, neutrino masses, vacuum stability, so on and so forth. And there is a number of models that are already on the market that aim to explain one or more of those problems and I think that it's really important that we find some distinctive features of those models, the way to test them, to prove them, or to exclude them, to see, to progress with our understanding of physics. So the Frick's doublet models is a class of models where instead of just one SU2 doublet, we have three. Those models are, have very rich phenomenology because of the possib possible different symmetries that can be imposed in the model that will result in a different particle spectrum, different phenomenology, for example, in the Frick's debit model, we can have dark matter candidate NSB violation, which is not possible in the IDM. In this talk, I will talk about the Frick's debit model with the symmetry. Uh, so the symmetry is defined here. Under this symmetry, we have the, one of the doublets and the standard model fields are even, and the extra two doublets that we added are odd. This is the potential. I listed here to so that it's quite complicated. It has 21 parameters. That also shows you that what are the differences between multiscalar models. In the two Elizabeth models with the two symmetry, we have seven, seven parameters. Five free, because two are Higgs by the Higgs mass. Here, we just add one more doublet, and we increase the number to 21 parameters. That, of course, makes numerical analysis of the model quite difficult. The other distinctive feature of that model is that although we have the two symmetry, we can still have CV violation. We can still have, uh, we can still have complex parameters that are those four listed here. Among them, three, in three independent phases. We can remove one of the phases from those parameters just by rotating the doublets. Recovery interactions are set to model one type, so that on the, the Z2 even doublet, five free couples to fermions, and by doing that, we have constructed explicitly that a symmetric Lagrangian. Now, if you want to have dark matter, we cannot violate that symmetry. We ha it has to be conserved. Therefore, the vacuum state that we are looking at is the one that preserves this imposed to symmetry. So that means that only this fair doublet has vacuum expectation value, and those Z to odd doublets don't. And this one, this doublet, is by construction at the tree level, basically standard model like a tree level interaction of that particle are just like in the standard model with fermions and gauge bosons. The difference you would see in the loop mediated processes, for example, Higgs to gamma gamma, where the extra particles that we add can change that ratio. But on the tree level, everything is just like in the standard model. Those two doublets, the two doublets mix, and because we have those complex parameters, because we have CV violation, the physical states, S1, 2, 3, and 4, are actually the mixture of all of those possible states here, so they do not have a defined CV parity. I, I would like to say that we have the mixture between scalar and pseudo-scalar, but I remind you that because those particles don't couple to fermions, we don't really have a way to determine the definite CV parity. But all we know is that the states here, H and A, have opposite parities, but which one is which, we don't know, but that's not important, that's not relevant. We know that those have the mixed CP parity. Uh, so, and of, well, of course, we also have the charge sector with four particles here. Uh, the lightest particle, which we chose to be S1, is the dark matter candidate. It's stable because it cannot decay. 
And this model has actually really interesting black matter phenomenology. There is a large parameter space when you can be in agreement with all experimental constraints, but that will not be the main focus on the talk here. What I want to talk is about the CP violation that we have in this model. Those scalars do not couple to fermions. We do not change the fermionic sector at all. CK matrix is just a decision standard model. We don't do anything here. We know that those scalars have mixed CP parity, and the question that we've been asking ourselves when you're working on that model is that, is that CP violation relevant? Because if it happens just in the dark sector, and, and we cannot really test the, test the interactions of those particles there, right? We, we only see what we see here. If all that CP violation is hidden there, then it doesn't matter. I mean, it's there or it's not there. It won't affect our world. Uh, you would think naive, I mean, it is true that we, if we look at the interaction at Lagrangian, we know that there is a violation because, for example, we have interaction with Z boson. We have all of those six possible vertices, Z, S, I, S, J. That is a, that is a sign of CP violation. If we compare that to the uh, CP conserving frequency habit model, where we only have the two, the, uh, those, those four uh, types of interaction, well, then we know that it is a CP violation. But can we really see it? somehow. We don't really, because we could look at, for example, at the, see at the mono Z, mono Higgs signal when we have Z decaying into S1, S2. Assuming that we can even produce all of those production, or production processes and then, then decays, it's not really, it looks exactly like the CP conserving models of a different type. For example, Figgs Abbott model with a singlet. We will have the same number of vertices. We would, we, this process doesn't really test the CP violation. It just tells you that there is, a, let's say, six possible decays. But it's not really a CP violation. So we were saying, is there anything that we can actually test as a honestly CP violating observable? And uh, what we decided to look at is the ZZZ vertex. So uh, we have the triple vertex here is that this one is off show. Those two we chose to be on show. And this is the general Lorentz structure of that vertex. It has, uh, at the, in the standard model, at the three level, this vertex doesn't exist, of course. But because we have other new particles which couple to Z, we, in principle, may contribute to that vertex here. And there are two types of um, contributions to that vertex if this is off show and two on show particles which are parameterized by this uh, factor F4 and F5. This one is the CP violating observable. It, conser it conserves parity, but violates charge. And this one violates both C and P, therefore it's a CP conserving one. What can be in this vertex depends, of course, on the model. In our model, the number of vertices, the, type, the structure of that vertex is limited by the Z2 symmetry, because we cannot have vertices like ZZ scalar or Goldstone Z scalar because Z2 will be violated. So the only way to construct this type of vertex in this model is to have diff neutral scalars running in the loop. Th those scalars have to be different because of the, uh, of the momentum. That, uh, if, if, the, if, if it was just one scalar, assuming that we would have even Z as, as vertex, then it, it would cancel to zero. So what we did is to, uh, we looked at all of the possible diagrams with our four particles that we have in the model, and we have calculated this contribution to this factor F4 using the loop tools. And uh, I show you the, uh, well, the result here. Unfortunately, it's not the analytical function. All we have is the numerics, which makes it a bit difficult to study the model because we can't really properly analyze the function. We just have to basically look at the parameter space and see what, what we get. The important part here is that, well, we have this contribution from the loops, but we also have this factor, which I call this G here. This factor here is related to the couplings of, the, of the, those scalars, inner scalars to Z. And if we have no CP mixing, or if that mixing is really, really small, we expect the CP violation index to be small, and that's what we see, because those, those couplings depend basically on the rotation matrices, of the elements of the rotation matrix. If we, do, if we don't have the mixing, one of those elements would be zero, and then it would drive the whole factor, factor to zero, as we would expect. So an example of how those uh, are, and 
the other thing that is really important is that this factor is, of course, dependent on the momentum on the, on this, of the offshore particle. So it's not a number, it's a function. Uh, so uh, that's, and the dependence on this momentum Q is shown here. This, this function has both real and imaginary part, which behave differently depending on the value of, of, the, of, this, incoming, of, the, of this moment. Uh, now, can we, can, we, can we see that? I mean, this is, this is a vertex that is not a proper one in a sense. I mean, it violates gate invariance. It's not, it's, we cannot really put it in the uh, Lagrangian and say, okay, that, that's it. I mean, we have to sort of think of the observables that are actually sensitive to this kind of Uh, that should be I, of course. Okay. Yes, thank you. Yes, I'm sorry. That, that it should be I because we have so that is the cup. We have to crow, close close the loop here, uh, right? So it's uh, for example one two three or two three four, right? Uh, and then yeah, that that should be I. Thank you. Uh, yeah. So what's I? Yeah. So we have we have this uh, this factor f4. It will differ depending on the masses and the couplings in the model. And now the question is how can we test it? Well, we do not have the end results of it. Of it. I will tell you why in a second. But uh, what we are thinking of is looking at, the, for example, the production of those Z bosons, for example, at the E plus C minus, e minus colliders, assuming that we can measure the helicities of the final bosons that are produced, for example, through the measuring the decays of those bosons, we can consider a number of asymmetries. They will, which will uh, depend on that coupling, on that uh, CV violating coupling. They will depend on the uh, energy. They will depend on the angle between, I mean, you can measure the angle between, uh, so that is theta, between the incoming E minus beam and the Z boson that is being produced. An example of that asymmetry is shown here. This, so this, is, this one, we call it a generic A because we have factored out the coupling. So it's just sort of the phase space. But you can see that uh, it is for it's like backward forward for small and large values of theta. We see different behavior. That, but this, unfortunately, has to be multiplied by this imaginary part of lambda 4, the value, the value of that coupling. And now... Is the, and the question is, can we get any reasonable values for that? And the answer is, unfortunately, that right now we don't know yet. Because, as, as I said, we have 21 parameters. It's, that's an extremely large parameter space. And there are no uh, analytical formulas. I mean, everything here is numerics. The F4 is numerics. It depends strongly on the masses and the couplings and the Q. The, uh, the masses are also has, have, to, have to be obtained numerically because it's a 4 by 4 matrix. And we don't want to impose any kind of symmetries apart from that. We just want to see what, is, in general, what is the most possible, what is the best, what is the worst type of scenario. So we're still doing that. Hopefully, the results will come soon. But what, what I can tell you already that we, uh, well, we have already found a different ways and different sort of regions how to get pretty relatively good results. This, the amount of CV violations, so sort of the size of this F4, would depend on the mass splittings. And actually, what, what is preferred is that the mass splittings are relatively large. That, but they cannot also be extremely large because then the loop will shrink because of, if, if the particles are extremely heavy, then that's also not very good. But if they are too close in mass, that is also not very good. And you can see that by looking at the mass matrix, that, that the neutral mass matrix, because the off diagonal elements here, they depend on those CV parameters. So if those parameters here are small, if, the, if there is not enough CV violation, then basically the, this matrix is sort of getting closer to block diagonal. And the rotation matrix is also getting closer to block diagonal matrix. So when you just mix states with the same CV value of the CV parity. So we kill one of, one of those R AJs that we had before. Basically, we just kill the, the, the coupling, the, the CV violating thing. That is something that actually happens in the Turkey-Zabeth model, not in general, but because of what we have measured at the LHC. You can construct very similar diagrams in the Turkey-Zabeth model with also those elements of the rotation matrix and the couplings between different undefined states here. However, LHC right now points us towards the alignment limit. That means that one of the Higgses that we have is basically a model Higgs, 
and the C and it's basically CP, CP even. That means that uh, of those rotation matrix elements, one of them will be one, but the other will be zero. So, but, so this type of vertex, although possible in the exhibit model, won't be interesting. It's not really interesting anymore. Not, yeah, but not, not because of any fundamental reason, but because of the experiment. But we don't have an, any requirement like that for the exhibit model. So maybe we can see that. Hopefully, so I will soon be able to present something more. So just to conclude, it is a model that is interesting. It has to be a violation in the dark sector, which we thought that maybe would not be visible, but we have found an observable. We have found a way to transfer that to the visible sector. And now the question is, theoretically it's possible, but is it possible to do that in, a, in an experiment? I don't know yet, but hopefully. Okay, thank you. Questions? Uh, just a naive question. In the case of the standard model extended with just one inner doublet, uh, you have the possibility to have CP violation or you need the third one? Uh, in, in for the inner doublet model, you cannot have CP violation because if we impose the two symmetry, then, uh, you, I mean, technically you can still have one of those parameters, but there is a rotation freedom, so you rotate it out, and there is no way to do that. You have to, to, yeah, to, you have to add you something you else. You need one strainer, though. But that's a point. So I could have with the IDM plus a singlet. Yes, yes. So if you had IDM plus a singlet, and, the, and there is a, uh, and there is a co one complex phase, because then you end up with two complex parameters, one of them can be rotated out, but still one of them would remain. So you could have... You could introduce the evaluation to inner model by adding a singlet. That would work as well. Okay. So that would be exactly my point. So, so have you guys studied already the IDM plus a singlet with a complex CP with CP violation or no? Uh, so yeah. So people from Lisbon were looking at it. They uh, they got what they got was pretty small values of that uh, of that CP violating coupling. Small, but all of my is smaller than what we are getting here, and it is not clear to me yet why it, it why it happened. If it, if they just have limited themselves on the uh, well to certain of the parameter space, which mm -hmm. will be smaller than what we have here. I mean, because you know, we yeah. of course want to be in agreement with experimental constraints. For example, with dark matter, so uh, you don't want to overproduce dark matter, you ha and you have larger. Room, more room for that yeah, in the yeah. Fugazabet model than you have even with the IDM plus singlet, just because you, we have more particles yeah, they can co-annihilate, right? So uh, I've, maybe they have put themselves in the corner uh, that will sort of force uh, relatively small values of this F4 because of the constraints that have to be imposed on the IDM plus singlet. That may be a possibility. And that would actually be, I mean, that would be interesting to know, to be honest, because as I said with the two Kizabeth model, the fact that we are killing this F4 comes from the LHC, from test, but it comes from testing the properties of Higgs. So sort of the uh, limit for CP violation comes from testing CP violation in a sense. So for instance, the yeah. only way you can differentiate your the IDM plus singlet, complex singlet, from your, yeah. your model is if you had somehow, you could be able to observe the extra scalars because from logically speaking, the kind of are the same, right? So I don't know how we can observe those scalars because of course they, I mean, the, it would be a missing energy, right? The, the, stable, the stable one would just escape. Uh, we have more diagrams. If we were able to sort of observe a cascade decay, for example, uh, but I don't even know if that's possible. That, but, but yeah, I mean, yes, if we, if we were able to see like, so, for example, those six decays somehow, all, all of that into all of those inner particles, that would be a signal that it's, not, that it's that is, for example, not uh, IDM plus singlet, or that it's not CPU uh, series Elizabeth model, just because of the number of those thresholds of those, of those events. But uh, if that can be distinguished at a, a collider, I, I honestly don't know. I mean, because at the end, what you will see is the missing energy and that so further questions no so let's thank this week again
So now we'll give some time. So Ruzbe is going to lead the session, but we're going to give some time to Mariano Kiros. So he has a really nice last name. So he's uh, kind of Spanish version of my last name. <laughs> So, just to conclude, and then Ruth Bay is going to lead the discussion session. And then we go for coffee break. Uh, let me find. <laughs>